questions, comments, rants, raves, <laughs> stock tips. Yes. Well, let's say that I'm, I'm listening to uh, uh, a news report. Let's just say for the sake of argument, it's Fox News. Mm -hmm. And um, they're using grammar. And um, you, you would say, and, and I would say, mm -hmm. they're, they're making choices to manipulate the reality that they uh, they They're constituting people in their scenarios and stories as subjects of a certain sort. They can only do so if they call on the workings of a particular social force that sets up the norms to do that. And what they want you to do is to accept that ideology, right? That ordering. They want you to think it's natural because the grammatical choice will look natural when you take that as natural. So yeah, I love Fox let's just say. Mm -hmm. uh, am I Am I choosing to ignore that they're making choices, or uh, am I... Well, so first of all, we know, I mean, from, you know, psycholinguistic research, that this thing of considering a semiotic system and, and the choices is done in large part unconsciously, right? That is that I, when I give you a heavily ambiguous sentence, you usually are even unaware. Uh, Halliday has a wonderful thing about you know, smoking, a long sentence about cause and correlation of smoking. And he shows it has like 119 different meanings. And you never are aware of any but maybe two. Because uh, the, one of its meanings is that it isn't cigarettes that cause uh, cancer, it's cancer that causes cigarette smoking. But you would never think of that because you know the conversation is that. So, but I'm saying that at least when I used to do psycholinguistics, which is a while, now a while ago, um, a going theory was you compute all those 119 at rapid speed, but then as you're also simultaneously inputting formal semantics and situational semantics, you simply rule out all of it and you're largely completely unconscious. That's for the simple reason if you were conscious of it, you, you wouldn't get anywhere. So the moral of this that goes to the, maybe your question, the re so there used to be a movement in England uh, that really got started by English department people and Farrakhalov later wrote a book about it and kind of honor it called Language Awareness. And it was that unless you get aware of how this stuff works, you're, you're going to be the victim of it. And that therefore that's the rationale for teaching this stuff. Whatever guise or theories you put in it, the rationale is um, you will always be a victim of a Fox or CNN or whatever until you bring some of this knowledge to consciousness. And we used to think when we academics were a little more egotistical uh, that we had some tools to help you do that. We don't have much faith in our tools anymore. But they used to back in the 50s. It's like a magic trick, uh, an mm -hmm. adult watching magic versus a child watching magic. Yes, it's the exactly adult like that. looks at this hand, whereas the child looks at that hand. Right, yeah, because he hasn't been trained in the ideology yet. But remember, we're not talking about this stuff is evil. Some of it is evil, some of it is good. I'm arguing it can't be another way given what we are. But that doesn't mean, because we're also people who can engage in metacognition and metalinguistics and stuff, it doesn't mean we can't be uh, active in changing it, right? But it does mean it takes, God forbid, an education. I never thought I'd say something that wildly conservative. And it does take tools for you to, especially, by the way, in a world where there are competing ideologies, multiculturality, diversity, uh, the, the, uh, it takes tools to understand the submerged parts of meaning, which like the iceberg are huge. Now we cannot bring everything to consciousness, but that doesn't mean that you are morally exempt from bringing any of it to consciousness. Yes? Um, you said that grammar is in our head. Yes, grammar is there. It's also in the world. There's different senses, but you do have... That's not my question. Okay. And on one of your slide deck, and during your slide deck presentation, on one of your slides, something, you know, yeah. is by the phone. Yeah. My question is, grammar is in our head, is punctuation. Because John, comma, 
is by the well, it's no, different than John is by the you're, you're, you're leading me to great controversy and because I also am in schools of education and their understanding of linguistics is about zero percent. So no, uh, in the way in which I meant language in your head that it is specified in part by a biological process that distinguished you, let's say, from chimpanzees just like some of your anatomy does. This does not make you better than a chimpanzee. <laughs> uh, you got a template for grammar that is represented in different ways in many different languages, but not infinitely different, okay? So it's a con, you know, I know people don't like this in the humanities. Um, but in that way, no, punctuation is not in your head. However, one of my signal contributions to psycholinguistics was to show that what we call phonological phrases that are part of prosody and which is what commas are trying to mimic is in your head. It's part, people attributed for years uh, lots of stuff to syntax that I and Francois Gauchon later showed could only be attributed to phonological theory. Now it's con that's controversial because phonological theory being if it's part of that specification which this research would show um, then it means that language being oral is somehow important to humans. Doesn't mean you can't have other languages, but it means there's an oral part of it that is specified. So no, not the why the reason, in this sense, anything with literacy is not in your head is literacy is basically a brand new invention. By the course of evolution, we got it yesterday. Language has probably been around for several hundred thousand years, and I think almost certainly was in other, you know, remember there were multiple sorts of humans, and I think, I think the Neanderthals probably had language, but I don't know. That's just, uh, but it's, it, we certainly can't argue that literacy got evolved into us because it's a cultural invention that's a few thousand years old. I mean, in the Chinese, they had it much longer than us, right? But, Look, I mean, it's, it's uh, old, but it's not old enough to have grown. But now, see, if you don't buy any of that biology, then, yeah, pun, commas in your head, everything's in your head some way. Yeah? Okay, Dr. Smith, how about that? How about we try, what if our linguistic ability is just a byproduct of us walking straight? The way we do. Well, it could be, yeah. I, that's another argument. If it got in your head in evolutionary terms, it could have got there through Darwinianism, right? And for years, Chomsky believed it didn't. It was, it was a spandrel. It, was, it took a ride on something else, right? It didn't, we didn't evolve to have language. Some other capacity evolved that, by luck, gave rise to language. And he's changed his view on that. His most recent book is a long argument that a language did evolve, so he's changed uh, that theory. You know, he's at the University of Arizona now, so you can go ask him. Um, uh, if my own view, this used to be argued, I haven't heard it argued recently, uh, because more and more people are arguing language did evolve. If it evolved on another system, my bet is it was the perceptual system. Um, I, I think that if something evolved and then language took a ride on it, it was the perceptual system because I think the grammar of the perceptual system is similar to uh, uh, linguist language but much more, even much more complicated. So I don't know. We don't know. I mean, I don't know that. Uh, some pe it could be standing upright. It could have been eating soup. I don't know. But uh, mm -hmm. something did it. It's hard to know. I mean, the argument of how it evolved and why it evolved is really quite new to get the evidence for it. But at any rate, I... I it, I'm not saying uh, language evolved as a s separate capacity, which Chomsky says. It could, I say it evolved as a capacity. It may very well have been a neural uh, connection to another capacity, uh, and maybe it didn't. And, and I'm not saying that all languages are the same. I'm saying that there is a set of constraints on uh, our capacity for grammar that would be different for a Martian. I mean, see, it's not the least bit controversial in the study of animals to say that there are some birds who know how to make their nest or sing their song as an instinct, right, that they don't need training. It's not the least because we know it's true. Now, that does not mean they just do it. They have to babble with sticks to make the nest. They have to babble with sound to make it. They, but they don't need uh, a model. So the animals having instincts that, is, that specify a template that still has to be triggered isn't rare. I, I don't think a lot rides on it. If you wanted to say, okay, I don't want to buy any of that stuff, 
then uh, you can say it's just a set of social conventions that weirdly all engage in predication, uh, as, there, as Strawson pointed out, and, uh, and then just say, but it's still a set of choices. Uh, we'll test this when we find the Martian. Because the Chomsky prediction is you won't be able to understand them at all. Their language will bear no similarity to ours. And uh, the other prediction is it'll be pretty similar. By the way, the same with appearance. I mean, aren't you making the prediction that it will be pretty similar? Because the Martians are, if the Martians are also engaging in social relations. Maybe they, well, I would also argue they engage, they might engage in very different social relations. You know, uh, look, the chimpanzees are a very hierarchical species, right? Regular chimpanzees. And they settle things through violence and competition. And they're herd animals, and pack animals, in the sense that their loyalty is entirely to the Bonobo chimpanzees bear, bear a tremendous similarity to them, and they don't behave that way at all. They, have a, they settle things through sex. They settle conflict by sexual play. We evolved from the chimpanzees. It's a pitiful, sad story. What if we had evolved through the bonobos? <laughs> so I don't know what the Martians will do. Uh, I, if, if the Martians engaged in hierarchical societies like ours, built around sociality that is ordered in hierarchy, then yeah, I'd say their language would be similar to have to have. But they may do things completely differently. They're, for example, maybe their language is a language of smells, but it still has a syntax, but maybe it doesn't have predi predi predication. I don't know. We'll see. They're, we're on the verge of finding one of these guys. I'm surprised that you're taking that. Back yeah, why? Because it seems that the, the global point that you're making is that social relations require that we adopt separate roles, or that require oh, that we adopt. Oh, okay, I see roles. your point. If their sociality is like ours, which is what we call social relations, then absolutely they would have to have something like the constitution of subjects. There'd be no other way, right, exactly. But maybe they're not social at all. Maybe, maybe they uh, communicate to rocks. I don't know what they do. I know they probably don't have two hands and a nose. Maybe they're this big, Art. By the way, maybe they don't move, and therefore they wouldn't have a brain at all, as you know. Right? You argued that, so maybe they don't have a brain, but they're very complicated. Possibly, I don't know. Yes? Let's go back to this planet. Oh, yes. <laughs> I'm fascinated by what you spoke of as the grammar, and I read symbolism of clothes, mm -hmm. and how I was thinking how children immediately learn about that grammar and learn about their options. Right. Right. Why do those of us who teach English have to struggle so hard to have students learn the grammar of language and that they have many options there? Mm -hmm. it is not you don't have to struggle at all for them to do that unconsciously, right? We, we are all, at, through our learning of language, know the syntax of language, know the choices, and as social members of society, we know the conventions. What you have to do and what is difficult is bring that knowledge to consciousness. That's the purpose of education. You, it, 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 to survive and dar what? It's in their conscience. Order. Absolutely, it's in their conscience. Furthermore, it's in their practice. Yeah. So you could get kids. Uh, you don't want to get fussy about there being only one good dialect, right? Because you could get kids to look at, for example, choices made in a rap song, grammatical choices and what they did, why they did, how they got there, historically, culturally. You know, and then you can say this, this is what happens in novels, this is what happens in films, this is what happens in life. But those choices, you'd want to give them examples, even in their own life, where they screw you if you're unconscious. Not all the time, you can't be, but you, I, I really think that the one, most important feature in our societies now where we have profound inequality and on the way to hell in a handbasket with complex systems is the one thing you want to teach a person is how not to be a victim. And that's what education ought to be about. Not your job, not Walmart how to not be a victim. And we used to believe the way to not be a victim is use the meta-awareness that you're capable as a human being. Now, on the other hand, meta-awareness relates to a form of consciousness that lets you know you're going to die, that everything really doesn't matter. You know, it leads to suicide, but at least you're not a victim of anybody else's hands but your own. I think that any one last question, if anybody has it, yeah, you've already asked several, if anybody wants to ask all right, you get your, oh no, okay, you do. Your choice, you, good, good. I, I think I'm still a little fuzzy on how all this works.
words together, but like coming at it from the linguistic point of view, uh, I don't I don't totally understand what you mean by grammar. Like, what's the role of grammatical versus ungrammatical? Um, like, that I mean, you don't you don't. Uh, so we talked about gr what I'm trying to mean by grammar is in every part of grammar, the lexicon, yeah. uh, uh, words, phrases, patterns, which are important, metaphors, all parts of grammar where you create structure that, that, that then is aligned with kind of literal formal meaning by <coughs> relatively static roles, but then put into very nuanced meanings when you use it in context. Mm -hmm. So grammar is just like you had a choice today to wear a different shirt than you're wearing. Mm -hmm. And you could have made some choices that would have everybody in the room said, I, she must mean something by that, uh, both by being too formal and too informal, right? Mm -hmm. And so you, have a, you know your little grammar of clothing. That is, you wear a thing, on, not, not a, you have a top and a bottom, and they're supposed to match in a certain way, and they're supposed to fit with it. You know that. It's a very simple semiotic system. It's not a real grammar. Human grammar is like that on steroids. It is a construction of syntax by which you can combine anything with anything so that you get not dozens of choices, millions of choices, right? That's the, the efficacy or infinity of language Chomsky is talking about. That's its real point. It's as if you, now, society takes that capacity for that, which our brains are extremely fast at processing, <clears throat> and takes that capacity for choice and really runs with it to create us, to create us as social beings, and with that domination, control, hierarchy, agency, but constraint. Yeah. That's what grammar is. It's a set of choices that happen to have a certain structure, recursion, predic predication, that allows it to be efficacious for communicating anything. But people normally mean by that, you could say in words anything. I'm saying you can say through choices anything. Mm -hmm. That it, it, what you say is only a very small part of what you communicate. If I could just follow mm -hmm. up, I, I mean, uh, thinking about other levels of uh, linguistics, I mean, Sociophonetics is a field because you can make many phonetic choices. You but can. We don't usually think of phonetics as a grammar. We think of the grammar of sound being phonology. But you have many fewer choices in Well, phonology. so I would, now this is a prejudice, but I would uh, say phonetics is a system like clothes. It's not in a real grammar, but it's still a semiotic system. Yeah. Uh, without any doubt, phonology is a grammar. Now, people didn't always used to think that. They thought it was a set of lists. But it's actually a grammar with its own structures. And, but so remember, I'm not saying that a gr language is the only semiotic system we have. No, yeah, yeah. I'm just saying that without it, we, that we could never have evolved all the misery we've created as humans. OK, time to quit. Thanks.